I wish you all uh, a good viewing experience. My name is Russ Humphreys. Uh, I'm a physicist, retired from Sandia National Laboratories, where I worked as a physicist for 22 years. And I do creationist uh, research and writing and speaking. Uh, and I, one of the subjects is uh, on a, a creation cosmology. How, how did light get here in a real hurry on in uh, six ordinary days, light from distant galaxies, things like that. All right, uh, I am wanting to talk about a more biblical cosmology. Uh, I have two previous cosmologies that one of which I wrote a book on and another I wrote an article on, uh, but I am never been satisfied with them. They didn't take enough account of what God said he did on the fir first four days of creation. So this one that I'm still working on tries to do that. So let's look at the very beginning of the first day of creation. Let's see. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You see nothing but blackness right now. We're big, right at the beginning uh, before there was anything. And then he created the heavens and the earth. And uh, the heavens, a lot of people stumble over that. That is the space where people uh, will see the sun, moon, and stars later. Uh, but actually God does not make the host of the heavens until the fourth day. That's um, so uh, he calls it the host of the heavens in Genesis chapter two, verse one. So now people want to know when God created. Well, according to the Hebrew scriptures, Hebrew version, the original Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament and the chronologies in it, uh, that beginning was about 6,000 years ago, give or take. 200 years for chronologist errors and such. Uh, and science, uh, I have worked on a project uh, that shows that the beginning was only 6,000 years ago, give or take about 2,000. So, and there's lots of other science along that line, uh, but that particular one uh, really uh, nails it down to 6,000. So the next verses are these, the earth was formless and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. Now, what's the deep? Well, according to my favorite Hebrew lexicon, that's a dictionary of Hebrew words for Hebrew experts, uh, the deep, which is the Hebrew word to home, uh, just means a large body of water. It could mean the ocean or underground water or something else. So uh, now, so I'm going to put a picture of the deep up here. This is my picture of the deep. And you'll notice it's spherical. And uh, here's how I picture what the deep was. The deep was a big ball of water. And you'll notice I'm, I say that it was much bigger than the earth. And that's deduced from uh, a few verses and a few slides later. So, but a big ball of water. And ball, I get from uh, the Spirit of God was moving over or on the face of the waters. That implies that there was an up and a down, which means that there was gravity already at work. And gravity would pull any body of water uh, out in space <clears throat> into a sphere. And I think it was ordinary liquid water. <clears throat> Hebrew uh, <clears throat> has other options, uh, other words that could be used for other materials. <clears throat> Excuse me for harumphing here. So the earth could be scattered atoms at the center. Uh, now that's I deduce from God saying the earth was uh, formless and void. 
and darkness was on the face of the deep. But uh, uh, the earth could simply be scattered atoms at the center. So that's how I understand formless and void. And uh, all is darkness now, but God will light up the face of the deep. God said, let there be light, and there was light. So let's turn on the light. Now you'll notice the light is shining from all directions. And that's what I think he did first, because we'll see what he did in a while that made it come from a different, uh, in a different way. So God saw that the light was good. Now the next part of that verse is this, God separated the light from the darkness. So my understanding of that is that <clears throat> he made the light shine from one direction rather than all directions. <clears throat> so uh, now the source of that light is not the sun because he doesn't make that until verse 16 on the fourth day of creation. It's called the greater light there. <clears throat> so this is some other source of light. Now, what people want to know what that source was, uh, there's a hint in Psalm 104, verse 2. You'll notice, uh, covering thyself with light as with a cloak. That part of the psalm refers to the first day of creation. So I think he wrapped himself, took all the light and wrapped himself up with it, and uh, then it was shining from just one direction. Now, you... Uh, uh, We'll get to this verse, verse 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and morning one day. As far as I can tell, this is God's definition of a day. If you wanted to know how long it, or what a day was, it's one rotation of here the deep, or uh, later on of the earth. So this is God's definition of the day. And people want to know, how long were the days? Well, we have scripture on that. Uh, on earth, uh, is a, just a by point, the days were of ordinary length. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. That's Exodus chapter 20, verses, verse 11, in the fourth commandment. Uh, now, the thing that really hits me is that the context of that verse is ordinary length days of the week. <clears throat> Let me just read to you that uh, uh, the context, uh, starting with verse 8 of that chapter. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. Then I'm going to skip a verse. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So this verse here that says uh, he made the whole universe in six days <clears throat> is sandwiched in between uses of the word day, the very same word. And here it is, yamim. Uh, that's the Hebrew, sheshet yamim. By the way, I'm not an expert in Hebrew, but I can read it and speak it a little bit. So um, sheshet yamim, six days, is what uh, that word for day is singular, is yom, plural is yamim. And he uses it all through this passage. And he says, for in six of those things, uh, he made the heavens and the earth. So uh, because of the context, then I think that those days of creation were uh, ordinary days. And uh, <clears throat> if they had not been, if they had been billions of years, as a good communicator, God, uh, we would expect him to use uh, some different words for the creation days. For example, he did not use the word olam. Uh, that's the word long time or age or eon. And he didn't say le elef dor, 
uh, to the thousandth generation. He didn't use that phrase. That would be about 20,000 years. <clears throat> and then uh, he could have said, he spelled it out with Hebrew uh, number, uh, Hebrew words for numbers. Uh, he could have spelled out the exact length of time. This is thousands, LFI, Revavot, that's myriads or tens of thousands. Shanim, that's years. He could have used that. In fact, uh, those numerical words, <clears throat> not in connection with years, occur elsewhere in Genesis. But he didn't use those. So I think as a good communicator, God was using the word day in the sense that all his audience uh, would, uh, would understand the meaning. So now here's the next thing God did. An expanse appeared at the center or a firmament. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. So that word expanse in the Hebrew is rakia. <clears throat> in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, it's called stereoma. And in the Latin Vulgate, it's called firmamentum. And the King James translators uh, simply transliterated that word for momentum, and I think they just invented a new word called firmament. Uh, so I'm not sure about the history there, but uh, <clears throat> rakia means something spread out by hammering thin. It's a very unusual word to find here. <clears throat> so uh, uh, <clears throat> I would have expected something quite different, and most. And it's caused commentators a whole lot of problems. Uh, but uh, if you look up other uses of it in the Old Testament, uh, it means something spread out by hammering thin, like a goldsmith hammering uh, his, his uh, foil of gold there. <clears throat> so uh, now, uh, so it's, I think, the rakia is something that is pounded thin in a fourth unperceived direction or dimension. Uh, so our space uh, is thin in a fourth direction we can't perceive. There's other scriptures uh, that point to that. Uh, so, uh, and, and yet it's solid, and yet it is unperceived by us as a solid. There's ways in modern physics uh, <clears throat> that that can happen. So we would be existing within a solid and not perceiving it. Um, it would move through us and we would move through it. So uh, that's my best guess about uh, why God used the word rakia uh, for this firmament. Now let's look at another part of the verse. In the midst of the waters. Uh, batok uh, is the word for in the midst. And it simply means in the middle of something. Uh, for example, uh, God, uh, Eve spoke of the tree in the midst of the garden in Genesis 3.3. Or God spoke of the tree of life in the midst of the garden, Genesis 2.8. So let's see what in the midst of the waters implies. The firmament, I'm suggesting, started in the midst, meaning at the center. Uh, the waters above the firmament uh, were something above this, this little spherical shell around what would become the earth. The waters below the firmament on the third day become the solid earth. God transforms them uh, into what we now perceive as a solid. So uh, that's the earth. But this dimension here of the firmament is not much bigger than what would become the earth. So it's on the order of 6,000 kilometers. Now, the face of the deep way out there uh, is something much greater than 6,000 kilometers in radius. So now uh, where I got uh, the actual size of it, uh, I'll show you in a while, uh, but point is it's still very small compared to those waters. 
The firmament did not stay this small size, however. The firmament expanded greatly. So if you'll keep your, your eyes on this animation over here, I'm going to expand the firmament and the waters above the firmament. Now, just so we understood what the word firmament means, God called the firmament heavens in Genesis 1, 6. So there's no doubt about it. But uh, you notice I say big enough for all the stars by the fourth day, because on the fourth day, uh, we have him uh, making and putting and placing the sun, moon, and stars in the firmament of the heavens or in the expanse of the heavens. So all the stars uh, have to go into this space beneath the waters above the firmament. So now this big expansion uh, is the stretching out of the heavens, I think, that scripture talks about like this one here. Uh, God who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Isaiah 40, 22. So, uh, and there's 16 other verses like this scattered throughout the Old Testament. Uh, it's a big event, and he has a lot of mention of it. It's always in connection with his great power. So, now, if the firmament is big enough for all the stars by the fourth day, uh, that means that it would be more than 12 billion light years above us. Where do I get that? From the Hubble Space Telescope, it can see about 12 billion light years out. Now, a light year is simply an astronomer's term for six trillion miles. So uh, it's a distance. So those, those waters above the firmament are way out there. Now, I wouldn't be really comfortable with this understanding, although it's just taking scripture at face value. But there's another scripture that confirms this picture, Psalm 186.4. So uh, it tells us that the waters are above the highest stars. Here it is. Praise him, highest heavens, and the waters that are above the heavens. Uh, Psalm 148.4. And uh, you notice I have greater than 24 billion light years. So a radius of 12 billion light years, a diameter of greater than uh, 24 billion light years. And uh, this looks like a solid shell, but really it's just a thin, wispy uh, collection of ice particles, both big and small. And the bigger ones would be like uh, planets of water with a, a, a shell of ice over them. Uh, ice planets, uh, let's say, or could be bigger than that too. Uh, but there's, they're spread out over an enormous area. So uh, it's very thin and wispy, like the rings of Saturn. If you look at them, uh, they're, uh, if you look at them, uh, not edge on, but uh, uh, anyhow, they're thin. So uh, again, a light year is six trillion miles. Now this psalm was written after the Genesis flood. So it wasn't talking about, some of you may, may uh, be still thinking of the vapor canopy theory. Uh, it wouldn't be talking about a vapor canopy that would have collapsed during the flood. So now let's graph the action. Uh, we have here plotted along the bottom, the distance from earth in light years. So this is about here is 6,000 kilometers, the radius of the earth. Here's a millionth of a light year. Here's one light year. And you notice I have the face of the deep being about uh, a light year or so out there. And I'll get to the reason for saying that in a, a little while. So uh, then we have 1 million light years and 10 billion light years. So this is what uh, the techies among you know as a logarithmic scale. It's a very compressed scale uh, uh, of distance. So I can show the whole picture. And then the vertical axis is time on the earth as measured on the earth, not out there, but on the earth. 
and one day, two days, three days, four days, five days. And here's the deep plotted on that. And uh, after one day, uh, we'll see what happens to the deep. I'm going to expand the deep. So keep your eyes on the animation. Those are the waters above the expanse. And here's the expanse at various times getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, the waters below stay waters until the third day of creation when God turns them into the solid earth we know now. So uh, now notice one thing that the deep and the waters, uh, the expanse and the waters above the uh, expanse have gotten out to at least 10 billion light years, maybe more, 20 billion, who knows. Uh, but uh, they have gotten out there within just a few days on the earth. So that means that uh, the waters above the expanse expanded, the expanse expanded, or the firmament expanded, uh, at a huge, tremendously fast rate. Uh, it would be trillions of times faster than the speed on earth, and it would be not as fast as the light speed was out there. So I am proposing that the speed of light uh, out there in the heavens was very high. But on Earth, we'll see in a moment why I say uh, the speed of light on Earth was just its normal value. So a difference in the speed of light out in the heavens, it was very high in order for uh, you know God to uh, remain within uh, his laws like relativity and have things work normally uh, out there, he would reach to his control panel uh, that's where it says uh, there's a dial labeled the speed of light. I'm just having fun with it here. And he twists that dial out in the heavens to a very large number. So now the speed of light uh, uh, was high in both directions. There's one cosmology uh, that has the speed of light being different in different directions. But here we'll see from another scripture that the speed of light uh, uh, was fast inward as well as outward. Now, why would God do it this way? Why not just start with the waters already way out there? My theory is that balls of water stayed behind. So I'll run this animation again for you. Here's the waters above the heavens here, but he's left balls of various sizes, all, all different sizes uh, below. And I'm proposing that on the fourth day, God made those balls of water into stars and planets. So uh, now, the outward motion of the of the firmament and also of the of the waters uh, would cause the red shifts that we now measure in the stars. Uh, distant stars, distant galaxies have uh, the light from their spectrum shifted toward the red side of the spectrum, and uh, so and the further away they are, the bigger the red shift. So this is what I'm proposing for the cause of the red shifts. <clears throat> now, uh, there would be enough water to make all the stars that the Hubble Space Telescope can detect uh, if the deep were originally a few light years in diameter. You would have enough water to provide all that material for the stars. <clears throat> so, let's get back to the light from the stars. Light from the stars was fast. And I'm going to run an animation, so keep your eye out here and uh, show you the light trajectories coming in toward the Earth. There they are. Boom. And you notice this red line that they all run into. That's the place where I'm suggesting that God slowed down the light to the normal value. Because now, uh, as far as we can tell, we see a cosmos uh, even nearby where light is, uh, has its normal speed. <clears throat> so he must have slowed it down sometime. 
And if he slowed it down all at once, everywhere, uh, uh, it will make things extremely easy to graph. And, and maybe, uh, uh, in fact, if he didn't slow it down instantaneously, there would be problems with my cosmology. So uh, now after the slowdown, I'm going to show you the trajectories of light then. Light is traveling much slower at its normal speed uh, in toward the Earth, everywhere. <clears throat> now, here's a, something that may boggle your mind if you're not familiar with relativity, um, but the speed of light really controls the speed of time. Uh, and I won't go into the reasons for that, but um, it, uh, there's a lot of good reasons to think that this is true and, and uh, relativity uh, would uh, work out and uh, we've verified relativity uh, very well. So, uh, but a lot of people don't realize that if light is fast, then time is fast. So time out in the heavens would be fast, but on the earth, we already had that Exodus 20, 11 verse saying time was normal uh, on the earth. Um, those, those were ordinary length days on the earth. So that means the speed of light would be of normal uh, value. So uh, now the implication, uh, oh, let me show you the time normal everywhere now after the light slowed down. The implication of time being fast out there until near the end of the fourth day uh, is that uh, billions of years worth of events would have happened. You notice I said worth, billions of years worth of events happened in the heavens during the first part of day four. And I'll talk more about that later. But if you had been out in the heavens, uh, with your instruments using fast time, you would uh, measure the ordinary speed of light out there, and all the laws of physics would appear to be normal. But as measured by Earth's clocks, uh, things are happening fast. So uh, now, by uh, clocks on Earth, this light would be extremely blue when emitted, but the slowdown would shift the light down to normal colors. And as we look back in time uh, at things, uh, uh, there would be a transition at 6,000 light years away from us. Uh, but things uh, beyond that distance would still look normal because of all the, the way things work out here. So there's a window back there, a window in time, uh, but looking through the window, uh, things look normal to us. Okay, why would God do it this way? Well, he wanted the starlight to get here fast. So Genesis 1.15, uh, and let them be for lights. So he's talking about the stars and the sun and moon. Let them be for lights in the expanse or the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. So somehow, this verse is saying, he got the light here in a real hurry. So I'm, what I'm proposing is that the speed of light was just fast out there. So now, the nearest star is four light years away. But Adam and Eve must have seen a lot of stars on the night of the sixth day. I don't think God would have them wait four years to see the first star. Uh, I think he wanted this, them to see a fully developed, glorious-looking universe. Now, more about time being fast in the heavens before the fifth day. Billions of years worth of events happened out there during four ordinary length days on Earth. I, I said that before, but I really wanted to spell that out to you and give you some evidence for uh, light uh, having elapsed a lot for, uh, for there being billions of years worth of history out there. And this, if you see my cursor, is uh, these are called the antennae galaxies. And uh, uh, they look like they have collided 
here's a close up of in that central region of what they look like uh, from the Hubble. But uh, this apparent collision of galaxies would take millions of their years out there, according to the simulations you can see on the internet. It's very interesting simulations. Just look up antennae galaxies and search for uh, uh, the simulations that were done by a computer of the spinning galaxies running into each other and splashing out uh, these two arms that you see. So that, and there are many other things out there in the heavens that point to a long history. So millions or billions of their years elapsed. Now here are some scriptures that imply this fast time in the heavens. Uh, Moses said that uh, to the Israelites, uh, so that your days may be multiplied as the heavens, the days of the heavens on the earth. So on the earth, your days would be uh, as great as the days of the heavens. And then talking about the Messiah, when he finally rules uh, in his kingdom uh, uh, on earth, uh, this Psalm 89, 29, is, uh, the psalmist is uh, wishing that his throne uh, would be as the days of the heavens. And then something that I've always wondered about from First Peter until I got this idea, uh, Peter uh, says that uh, the skeptics uh, of this day ignore that the heavens existed from long ago. So, and uh, other things, so uh, very interesting passage there, you might want to study that passage, 2 Peter 3, uh, this is verse 5. So, why did he do this? Uh, these big objects take a long time to develop themselves. So, he arranged for us to see a fully developed cosmos, so it could show us his mighty works, because he wanted us to see his glory and handiwork. Psalm 9.1. 19.1, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. So uh, I'm sure uh, there will be lots of questions on this and uh, I will be available to answer the questions. So thank you very much for your attention.